Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to the All Things Policy podcast by the Takshashila Institution. In this episode, we'll be speaking about a subject that's gaining quite a bit of traction, uh, especially uh, with the G20 uh, that's currently being hosted in India. The topic that I want to discuss today is on the blue economy. Now, that's a fairly broad subject, but we have the right person to discuss and debate this with. So I'm very delighted to speak with Ambassador Rajiv Bhatia, who is a distinguished fellow of the Foreign Studies Program at the Gateway House. He is a member of CII's International Advisory Council, Trade Policy Council, and Africa Committee. He's also the chair of FIKI's Task Force on the Blue Economy and served as chair of the core group of experts on Beamstech. He's also had a very distinguished career in the Indian Foreign Service, having served as ambassador to Myanmar and Mexico and as high commissioner to Kenya, South Africa, and Lesotho. Good evening, Ambassador Bhatia. It's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Carl, for uh, this gracious invitation. I'm very happy to be talking to you on the subject of blue economy. Thanks a lot, Ambassador. It's wonderful to connect with you after, after so long. In fact, I should uh, tell the listeners briefly that Ambassador Bhatia was one of the first speakers that I've had a chance to uh, do a podcast with. Uh, this is way back in 2020. And yeah, I was delighted to know that he, he still recollects uh, this, this particular engagement. So thank you. And thank it's, you. it's again, once again a pleasure. Yeah. So I thought like, you know, maybe start off by unpacking, you know, umbrella term called the blue economy, right? So can you give us a perspective on how can one define what a blue economy is? And uh, what are some of yes, the features of pleasure. a blue economy? Uh, I think uh, this is the right way to do. When, you know, a group of us began to study blue economy back in 2016, it was quite a mysterious term. But I'm very happy to note that now it has become almost a mainstream uh, topic in international relations. To define blue economy, essentially, we can say that we are referring to the variety of resources that oceans possess. And it is a question of uh, optimal utilization of those resources in a manner which is sustainable uh, with reference to the climate and environment. So... This is the fundamental difference between ocean economy and blue economy. Ocean economy lacks uh, the factor of sustainability, but blue economy is uh, very much anchored in the concept of sustainability. And yet, for the sake of utter clarity, we can say that often, sometimes, in place of blue economy, experts prefer to use the term sustainable blue economy. It may be a good idea to make a distinction between the ocean economy and uh, blue economy. Ocean economy is just all economic activities relating to oceans. But on the other hand, blue economy has sustainability element built into it. That is, we can use the resources as long as we are not uh, damaging or destroying them centered in the ocean. People go even to the next step and say in order not to leave anything in doubt, we would use the word sustainable before blue economy. So today the trend is to say sustainable blue economy, which fundamentally means using various resources of oceans, uh, you know, to provide uh, additional uh, food for humanity, uh, medicines for humanity, tourism, energy, and, you know, critical minerals and other materials which are all there in oceans. Fundamentally, the idea is very simple. The idea is that oceans have always come to the help of humanity. But now mankind has technology, new technology, which can be used, pursue this path more, as long as we know how to take care of uh, the health of oceans as well. No, that's uh, very helpful to get us started. You know, I I find this very interesting, Ambassador, because uh, you spoke about sustainability, which uh, hadn't crossed my mind when looking up about the blue economy. So uh, I, I wonder you know, whether this has a lot to do with the significance of, um, you know, India's coastline to this conversation, right? And geographically, we do have a very unique maritime position. Nine of our 29 states are coastal. 
And we, in fact, do have about 1,000 plus islands to add to this. And just to maybe, you know, talk about a few more stats around how the infrastructure on the blue economy has developed over the years. We have about 200 ports. We have about 12 major ports that handle approximately 1,400 million tons of cargo each year. And I did take note that infrastructure and logistics is a very important part of the blue economy conversations that the G20 has been having. If you could maybe give us a sense of how India uh, is looking at the blue economy and its approach towards a national policy on the blue economy. I think sometime last year, uh, there was a draft policy that was released for consultation. And uh, I'm sure uh, you would have your views on that, which we'd love to hear. Uh, But broadly, can you give us a sense of uh, what the draft national policy on the blue economy sought to achieve and what are some Uh, of its objectives? Thank you very much for that broad ranging question. I think blue economy narrative has actually emerged from, you know, the entire question of negotiations for uh, climate change, which began back in 1992 at the Rio conference. But really it picked up in this century and in terms of uh, international negotiations, From 2012 onwards, blue economy has become a subject that stands on its own. So in that context, if we shift our focus on India, we recognize that in the previous century, particularly until about 1980s, Indian policymakers used to be accused of being sea blind. You know, history ensured that we always looked at threats to national security coming from the north or the west and oceans were not seen to be the source of threat and therefore they could be ignored. But all that began to change Mm. before the century ended. And in the last 20 years, I think Indian policy is taking into account more and more the factor of maritime dimensions. So it was in this context, I think I can say in all objectivity, that the present government, since uh, the middle of the last decade, began to focus on designing a maritime the strategy and also a blue economy policy. They set up a special group under the auspices of the Economic Advisory Council of the Prime Minister, and this was run by the Niti Ayo. They gathered together a a large number of uh, various area experts, and uh, through uh, lengthy deliberations, they came up with this draft uh, blue economy policy. This was uh, during the COVID period. Uh, And I'm certain that if uh, uh, COVID had not intervened, uh, India by now would have had a full-fledged blue economy policy. Uh, As of now, the process got somewhat delayed, but that draft uh, produced by the Niti Aayog team is now, uh, you know, making the final journey. The decision was that uh, Ministry of uh, Earth Sciences will serve as the coordinating mechanism or the coordinating uh, ministry. They have sought uh, views from public and uh, government stakeholders. They are incorporating those uh, inputs into the draft. And uh, I think very soon they will uh, go to the government for final clearance. And we are looking forward to the day when we have a full scale economic policy. Now, very quickly, in terms of elements, uh, I think the basic idea is that Mm. the blue economy will become a major dimension of India's economic strategy. The plan is that this uh, domain should be used uh, to accelerate India's uh, development towards being a developed nation. And for this, they have thought it necessary Mm -hmm. that there has to be a very close integrated policy coordination approach among, you know, about a dozen or more players within the government. Several ministries are involved, you know, shipping, commerce and industry, environment, earth sciences, Ministry of External Affairs. So there has to be coordination there. But on top of that, I think for any big project, you need money. And this draft policy has recommended the setting up of uh, at least two new funds, one that would be called Blue Economy Development Fund and the other Maritime Development Fund. And on top of that, they are developing uh, certain uh, policies and principles. So we will have to wait until the policy is uh, announced. But we uh, in our task force are very keenly looking forward to it. Got it. No, I think, uh, and as you mentioned, that the blue economy, in fact, encapsulates so many facets, you know, and which is why this, it's a multi-stakeholder approach. 
that is required for this but you know mazar bade just trying to zoom out do you think that a multi stakeholder approach is also going to have its fair share of challenges uh, especially you know with with a country as as large as india and with uh, ministries with varying degrees of priorities right, right as as you would very well know so in terms of executing this policy uh, where do you see the challenges you know for maybe specific ministries that you could uh, maybe point out and do you think this will have any sort of impact in the way that the blue economy is uh, or the policy is carried forward right so what do you what do you think are some of those one or two three challenges that you can see with this multi stakeholder approach i agree with you i think for any new project a new plan you know we should be ready to assume that there could be challenges because after all we are starting a new thing but yeah. i think the nature of those yeah. challenges is uh, quite properly understood okay through this two year long long process of developing a policy fundamentally i think there is agreement that blue economy has three major pillars mm. first pillar is maritime security if there is no security seas and oceans around us there is no question of any economic development coming out of the oceans mm. therefore agencies like the indian navy the coast guard and you know all those uh, which are handling uh, disaster management mm. and national security are involved in this the second pillar very much is sustainability therefore uh, people such as ministry of environment uh, earth sciences and the rest of them they have to be very clear that whatever new activities india does this does not harm the environment and it does not enhance too much mm. the carbon footprint and the third is in my view very very important which is the the business part or the uh, productivity part mm. or you may even say the profitability part because blue economy policy can be made by the government it can be inputs can be contributed to by the scientists by the academics by the thinkers but at the end of the day all activities whether it is seabed mining whether it is making medicines out of uh, the materials available in oceans whether it is a question of running new uh, you know tourism cruise maritime cruises on uh, all this has to be done by business and industry so a major focus of uh, our task force in uh, india's apex uh, business chamber fiki is to interest new entrepreneurs new corporate leaders to impress on them that this is an entirely new area worth exploring and if technology is available is finance is available and if policy instruments are right then they should not be discouraged at all from mm. working on this so these challenges are there i think there is a reasonable understanding of the challenges mm. and i'm fairly certain that in policy execution they will be taken care of to a large extent understood stay tuned to all things policy We'll be right back after a short commercial break. I think that uh, sort of clears the air uh, in terms of you know how this policy is going to be laid out and I think it's interesting that you pointed out the role of the corporate sector in this because at the end of the day you want the industry to be on board with some of these ideas as you know the state capacity in india is limited in some respects whereas uh, it it has a fairly you know sufficient capacity in other areas so it's it's always helpful to have the corporate sector sort of pitch in i want to if you just yeah. allow me one quick thought here sure, uh, sure. it is that uh, you know we have to take into account that india is a federal entity you Correct. know policy can be made sitting in delhi but it cannot be given the final shape and it certainly cannot be executed without consulting the state governments yep so you said yourself that there are nine coastal states mm. so at the level of the coastal states and even at the ground level mm. which is the local level there is a need for consultation there is a need for engagement there is a need for dialogue so that as the policies are developed they are fully understood and supported by the state governments and by the local authorities local stakeholders you know mm. for example fishing communities in kerala or andhra all mm. of them will have to be involved only then you can have the maximum impact of a blue economy got it this actually brings me to uh, and, and since you spoke about this in the context of uh, the indian efforts uh, in strengthening its blue economy advantages 
uh, I wanted to like just pivot to the G20 and how the G20 as a forum is looking at uh, the blue economy. And um, I'm also aware that, you know, you, you had recently attended the Ocean 20 dialogue that, that happened in Mumbai. So can you uh, maybe give us uh, some ins- insights from uh, the dialogue uh, on how the G20 is imagining the blue economy and what are some of the opportunities for India to collaborate uh, with other countries? Yes, this is a very pertinent question. I'm very happy that you have put it to me. I was invited by Ministry of Environment, which was the host ministry for Oceans 20 conference, Hmm. to be there on the recent Sunday in Mumbai. This was a kind of a 1.5 track meeting where all the panelists and speakers were uh, essentially a mix of officials and experts. And the audience was entirely, you know, it composed of or it comprised uh, senior officials and experts from G20 countries. So in all, I think all of us were about 100 plus people. Mm-hmm. It was a whole day conference. Uh, it was built around three technical themes. And that explained how, you know, blue economy is developing. Right. The first was the science, technology and innovation dimension of blue economy. The second was policy, governance, and participation in blue economy. And third was the uh, financial mechanisms to promote and advance the cause of uh, blue economy. So on uh, science and technology and innovation, I think there was a very interesting discussion. I think a panelist quoted OECD study, Mm. which has uh, demonstrated that over 3 billion people depend on oceans for their livelihoods. Mm which means that oceans are indispensable for the economic development of uh, a large number of countries. There Mm. was also a very strong mention that we need to agree on what is called guiding principles on the development of uh, blue economy. There is no agreement yet on this. So I think the officials uh, in their working group run by Ministry of Environment, they have discussed this and they would develop those uh, guiding principles. And uh, I think there was also um, a very significant mention that considering that the impact of climate change on um, uh, our economy in future is uncertain, the governments will have to develop uh, what they call flexible or resilient policies. Mm. If the catastrophe is small, then you act accordingly. If it is big, then your policy should be ready for bigger disasters and that kind of thing. Mm. Then very quickly moving to the second aspect, which was governance. Mm. There we found that almost unanimity, I would say, on the need for intergovernmental mechanisms in every government. Mm. I think it's understood fully that blue economy is multidimensional and therefore the approach will have to be multidimensional as well. Mm. And in this context, experts pointed out that while oceans uh, represent a vast space, Only about 7% of oceans uh, have been mapped so far. That means there's a huge opportunity to gather and share data on oceans. And this obviously cannot be done by one entity or one nation. Mm -hmm. And therefore, G20 cooperation in this field is absolutely essential. And finally, on the third element, which is finance, it was very interesting, uh, Carl, that, you know, while broader public perception is Where is the money going to come from Mm. for uh, new blue economy activities? Experts pointed out that actually there is enough money for uh, green economy or for green projects. Mm. And they all can be used for blue economy or blue projects. So experts believe that uh, there is adequate money. It's all a question of spreading awareness about how to access, you know, the blue bonds and the green bonds Mm. and various kinds of uh, facilities available with the World Bank and the rest of them. So in short, the idea uh, was accepted that uh, G20 has uh, both an opportunity and a responsibility as far as oceans are concerned. Mm. And uh, we can uh, really look forward to the uh, final outcome documents which will emerge from the working group on environment and climate sustainability, which of course will be finally reflected in the Delhi Declaration of G20 Summit in September. Uh, thank you so much, Ambassador Bhatia. Uh, again, it, it's always nice to uh, hear an, an insider view of uh, what's going on you know, behind what is in some ways you know, a closed door interaction uh, among the G20 uh, officials. 
Uh, so it's always nice to know perspectives that give us a sense of how countries are approaching the blue economy. And you had also highlighted some of the sectoral areas that they focus on. In fact, I, and I think, you know, no conversation with you will be complete without asking for your insights on how Africa looking at the blue economy. And it's, it's fairly evident that oceans play a very important role in the livelihood of communities and people in, in, in that part of the world. So do you have any specific ideas that were shared by officials from the African countries uh, that you think uh, India can certainly collaborate, uh, but also maybe support in, in some cases? Thank you very much. Africa, as you know, is very close to my heart. And I thought uh, that uh, African nations began very well Mm. some three years back when uh, Kenya hosted one of the largest blue economy conferences with the help of the UN and a few other countries. And they had come up with a very good plan as to how Africa can enhance its role, given the fact that it is one of the largest continents surrounded by one of the largest ocean areas around it. But then, uh, you know what happened, COVID came Mm. and uh, Africa's economic uh, challenges became very sharp. Mm. You know, the debt, the health challenges, the slowdown in economy, all that probably to some extent delayed, if not derailed, Mm. the uh, blue economy and maritime plans of Africa. In uh, the meeting in Mumbai, of course, there were only a handful of countries such as South Africa presenting Africa. I did have some conversations with them. And this Mm. also figured yesterday at uh, a major IDSA conference on Africa Day. The short point is that African Union probably is still not fully ready Mm. to have uh, a pan-African dialogue with India on oceans. And therefore, we will have to fall back on bilateral dialogue with uh, important countries such as Nigeria, Egypt, South Africa, Kenya. But if you allow me, I wanted to add something that I saw at this meeting, but outside the conference room. Outside the conference room on the walls were displayed a large number of beautiful Mm. uh, paintings done by school children, Indian school children, you know, who took part in a paintings competition. Now, most of those pictures showed the children's uh, message to us, don't mess with oceans, Mm. Uh, you know, factory and Mm. carbon footprint is damaging oceans. So let oceans be, do not touch them. It was Mm. that kind of message. Mm. And I felt that this is probably not the right message that we should be inculcating in our young generation. Mm. Instead, you know, we have a middle path. We we should not neither be environmental fundamentalist, nor of course we should be people who don't care for environment. We Mm. should have a middle path where we should say, that it is our duty to look after the oceans Mm. so that they in turn can help mankind to develop and prosper more. Let's be very clear. Mm. Today, we are 8 billion people living on this planet. Come 2050, Mm. it will be 10 billion Mm. people. And those 10 billion people will not be able to fulfill their needs for food, energy, medicines, and other materials only from land resources. Mm. And therefore... We have to cultivate and leverage oceans, but in a very wise and prudent manner. Mm. And therefore, you know, I'm struggling and I'm going to discuss this with our task force people as well as Mm. to how to modulate and calibrate the message to the school children and to the young adults of this country. Absolutely, Ambassador. And I think I couldn't have come up with a better note to end this podcast. But uh, thank you so much for taking the time to share with us your observations from the Blue Economy Conversations, uh, both uh, at a national level and also as part of the G20. And I hope to speak to you soon once we have the national policy released. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll stay in touch. Thank you so much. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM Network. You can tune into them on the IVM Podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website, takshashila.org.in.